Okay, this video is going to talk about increased intracranial pressure, starting with some patho, and then we're going to go on to discuss some assessment and then interventions. So first of all, from outer to inner, the meninges go dura, arachnoid, and pia. So when we're going to start talking about some of the traumatic brain injuries and their mechanism of injury and the pathophysiology, it's important to understand the dura, arachnoid, and the pia because it helps you understand the location of that injury, how it's categorized. So the first one we're going to talk about is called an epidural hematoma. So epidural means above the dura because the dura is the toughest layer. It's the most outer layer. It surrounds all the cerebral structures and even goes down the spinal cord. So when a hematoma happens above it, it really goes above that tough outer covering. And what's also important about an epidural hematoma is that when you are hit in this temporal parietal region, there is an artery that runs here. It's called the middle meningeal artery. So with an epidural hematoma, that arterial vessel is accessed. And so therefore what you get is a quick accumulating space, space occupying lesion. So an epidural hematoma is associated with rapid accumulation and it requires evacuation surgically. And remember, it is arterial in origin. And then go on, this next one is called a subdural. So it, it's below the dura. So subdural hematomas have three different categories, acute, subacute, and chronic. The acute subdural hematoma is really similar to the epidural in that you need to evacuate it. It does accumulate a little bit more slowly because it is below the dura. It can either be arterial or venous in origin, so it could either be really rapid growing like the epidural or rapid growing but still venous in origin. The subacute may or may not need that very quick evacuation surgically. Um, so that's going to be a kind of a case by case basis and it's always venous in origin, but still um, going to be an emergency. It's still going to be somebody that will require acute care. Whereas the chronic subdural hematoma is the one that's associated with two populations, the elderly and alcoholic. Now what is it that those two populations have in common is that sometimes people may not know kind of when they have a change in their level of consciousness. Also both those populations have kind of a shrunken size of their brain alcoholics because of excessive alcohol consumption and the elderly because that's associated with advanced age. And so often it's discovered inadvertently when they came in and they're, you know, they're getting um, evaluated for something else and then it's discovered that they had this chronic subdural hematoma. You know, sometimes we won't notice when somebody is maybe more confused because maybe their baseline has a little bit of confusion with it. So those are two different or two different categories of hematoma. There's also a third one called diffuse axonal injury, which is basically just a diffuse um, inflammation that occurs within this cranial contents. So when the pressure increases, it's, it occurs kind of underneath all of the skull. So it occurs diffusely. So let's go on to talk about something called an uncal herniation. So an uncal herniation can occur with either of these types of hematomas. And this occurs when, let's say, this spice occupying lesion happening on the left side is now increasing pressure to where it is pushing on this separation between the cerebral hemispheres and the cerebellum. And when this happens, it pushes pressure on down and compresses this third cranial nerve that is in the brainstem. Remember, the cranial nerves always happen in pairs, and one and two aren't even located in the brainstem, but three through 12 are in the brainstem. 
And third, in particular, this third cranial nerve is responsible for the pupil dilation and pupil constriction. This is called the oculomotor cranial nerve. So when you have pressure from this hematoma, for example, pushing on this third cranial nerve, what you're doing is you're obstructing all parasympathetic innervation on this same side called the ipsilateral side. So compression on this third cranial nerve, obstruction of parasympathetic innervation allows now what type of innervation to come through? And that is the sympathetic innervation. So with an uncal herniation, what you get is pure sympathetic innervation on the same side of the hematoma or space occupying lesion. So therefore you have one-sided pupil dilation and that is called the uncal herniation. Now if the pressure continues to build up, so it's pushing on the same side, same side, to where it pushes over and even the pressure is built up, so now it's compressing on the third cranial nerve on both sides of the brain stem and not only on that same side, then what do you think you would get with the pupils? You would get bilateral pupil dilation because now it's compressing on the third cranial nerve on both sides of the brain stem. So this is also going to contribute to our knowledge when we're going to talk about assessment of the patient with neurologic injury. So pupil dilation, pupil size is part of it. Okay, so let's talk about ICP and let's, let's continue our discussion of intracranial pressure. In order to do that, we need to understand that Monroe and Keeley hypothesized that there are three contents within our cranial vault. There's brain tissue, there's blood, and then there's cerebral spinal fluid. And when there is an increase in any one of those contents, there needs to be a corresponding decrease in one of the other two. Otherwise, what you get is increased intracranial pressure because we have an unforgiving skull. We have a cranial vault that is made of bone and will not allow for changes in pressure beyond a certain parameter. So when that occurs, again, we have increased intracranial pressure. So normal intracranial pressure is 0 to 15, some books say 10 to 15 millimeters of mercury. So how would we know that? Well, the only way we would know that or we would be able to measure that is with an intracranial pressure monitor. So we'll go through and review three types going from the most invasive one to the least invasive one. So the most invasive one is called this intraventricular monitor because it goes right through to the anterior and lateral ventricle, right into the ventricles inside the cranial vault, which is almost like smack in the center. And this is also where the cerebral spinal fluid kind of resides. And so when you are able to have a pressure sensor that's going all the way through, to sit into the ventricle of the skull and then drain cerebral spinal fluid, you are able to see what the cerebral spinal fluid looks like as it's being drained. And not only that, you are able to decrease the pressure within the cranial vault because you are able to remove one of the three contents. Another thing this provides is the ability to actually assess, evaluate a patient's cerebral spinal fluid. So we know normally cerebral spinal fluid is clear, it's colorless, it does not contain any RBC, so it shouldn't be pink. It is also an ultrafiltrate of plasma. What does that mean? It means that it's made from blood. So what that also means is that it has glucose in it. It has two-thirds the amount of glucose that blood does. So we're going to talk about assessment that when we see something clear coming from the nose, how would we know if it's drainage from the nose or if it's cerebral spinal fluid, we check it for glucose. So that's a really important aspect of having an intraventricular drain is that you are able to evaluate CSF. But just um, understanding what CSF looks like also becomes relevant when we see patients with traumatic brain injuries and especially on quick first assessment 
you are able to evaluate what is coming out of either the ears and the nose to see if it is indeed have CSF in it because that means that in that assessment you want to know if it accessed the meninges. You want to know if CSF was accessed with that injury. So that's really important. Again, with this one, it's associated with the highest risk of infection. What that also means is that prophylactic antibiotics immediately, you don't want any risk of bacteria getting into the skull. In second order of invasiveness is either the subarachnoid or subdural, either one, and sitting there to a uh, pressure monitor with a pressure monitoring bag hooked up to a sensor and you are able to see it's a little bit less accurate at higher pressures, not quite as accurate as the interventricular, but at least it's not as invasive. And the least invasive is called the epidural. It is not within the skull at all. It's actually above the dura. And of course, that's the least accurate, but it's the least associated with the risk of infection.